Hello and welcome to Legal Thinking. I'm Liam Pape and it is just me this week. At the start of April, TikTok was fined £12.7 million for illegally processing children's data. The Information Commissioner said that the app had done, quote, very little, if anything, to check for underage users. So off the back of that, uh, we thought we'd have a discussion about data privacy uh, and uh, how companies can ensure that they are complying with uh, UK GDPR. So in this episode, we speak to Franz Vermeer, who is an associate in the dispute resolution team at RWK Goodman, and Charlie Ebert, who is an associate in the commercial team at RWK Goodman. We discuss best practices and ensuring compliance, other uh, common data privacy violations that uh, businesses can come across, as well as TikToks uh, allowing for underage users. And we also discuss what to do if it all goes wrong and if your business is found violating data privacy regulations. Without any further ado, let's roll tape. So uh, let's start off by uh, asking, can you explain the TikTok fine and what it means for wider business? The fine was issued for breaches of UK data protection law for the use of personal data of children under the age of 13 years old without parental consent. The ICO estimated that around 1.4 million children had been allowed by TikTok to use its platform in 2020, despite its terms and conditions saying that 13 was the minimum age to create an account. And it was suggested that the data was used to track and profile them. So the risk therefore was that they would be presented with inappropriate or potentially harmful content. And how did the UK Information Commissioner's Office, which as you said is the ICO, determine the fine amount uh, for TikTok's data privacy violation? The ICO uses a um, number of factors to determine an appropriate fine for an organisation that's breached data protection law. So that would be Um, Aggravating factors such as their track record of data protection compliance, um, how many breaches they've reported before or how many times this has happened to them previously. They would give thought to the amount of individuals involved, the age and vulnerability of the people involved, the type of data being processed and what it was being used for. But they would also consider mitigating factors so things like how the organization responded to the breach promptly and appropriately so what are some potential legal consequences for businesses that violate data privacy laws and how can they be enforced so there are a wide range of consequences obviously the ico fine or other enforcement actions such as an ico investigation it is is one potential consequence, which is what we're discussing here. But there are other consequences such as individual data breach claims from the data subjects that have had their rights infringed. And that can lead to compensation for non-material damage. So things like injuries and distress and also material damage such as financial loss. There's also obviously reputational factors and the impact upon customers trust in your organization and in terms of enforceability you know these are this is court action so the ICO is obviously a a regulatory body but court claims and any awards um, for civil breaches would be enforceable by a court order. In the case of TikTok, the data privacy violation involved the collection of personal data from children under the age of 13. What specific laws and regulations are are there around collecting data from children and how can businesses ensure that they're complying with these laws? Well, it's still the UK GDPR that applies to children's personal data. So in the same way that there are rules around how you can process adults' personal data, uh, the same rules apply to children's personal data. But there are also some additional rules around collecting and processing children's personal data because children might be less aware of the risks involved in in giving their personal data to an organisation. So as with adults, you must have a lawful basis to process children's personal data. And if that lawful basis is consent, then you need to ensure that the child can understand what they're consenting to. Otherwise, in the same you know, 
under the same rules as for consent for adults, um, the consent won't be considered informed and therefore will be invalid. Uh, so as part of this, um, you must ensure that all privacy information is in a form that can be easily understood by children. And that might mean displaying it in a way which children can properly engage with. So using graphics or, or videos rather than just a nice long page of writing so that it, it, you know children can properly understand it and make genuinely informed decisions about how their, their data is used. Then speaking sort of specifically around online services, so like TikTok, if you're relying on consent to offer that kind of service directly to a child, then in the UK, only children aged 13 or over are able to provide their own consent. And this is the, the, the trouble that, that TikTok got into. Um, if children are under 13, then the organisation needs to get consent from whoever holds parental responsibility for the child. Now, there are some very limited exceptions to this, so namely where the online service is a preventative or counselling service. But in all other scenarios, for, for children under 13, parental consent uh, would be required. If you're aware that children under 13 are likely to be using your online service, even if it's not specifically targeted at that age group, then you must make reasonable efforts to get consent from the person with parental responsibility and take steps to prevent children from creating accounts themselves. And, and that's what TikTok failed to do. It's also worth mentioning that there is now what's called the Children's Code. So this was introduced by the ICO in September 2020, um, and it actually postdates the TikTok investigation. But this is essentially a code of practice aimed at online services such as apps, gaming platforms, social media sites, etc., that are likely to be accessed by children and is really designed to help protect children in the digital world. And it sets out 15 standards of age-appropriate design, um, which reflect a, a risk-based approach. And the focus is really on providing default settings, uh, which ensure that children have uh, the best possible access to online services while still minimising to collection and use uh, by, by default. The code is not legally binding, but it is referred to by the ICO as a statutory code. And, and therefore, it's very clear that the ICO is indicating that, that a code is really um, what the ICO expect in terms of the processes and um, procedures that organisations must have in place when it comes to processing children's data. Um, and it's the standard against which businesses will be assessed against. So if you are collecting and processing children's data, um, then you must ensure that you are complying with the children's code, as well as the rest of the, the UK GDPR. So just on age gating, you suggested there that TikTok's violation could have been avoided if they'd implemented better age verification measures. What are some of the best practices for age verification in online platforms? And again, how can businesses ensure that they're compliant with these? Sure. So, I mean, to go back to what, what the rules say, the rules say that if you're offering an online service to UK children um, on the basis of consent, then you must make reasonable efforts taking into account the available technology and the risks inherent in the processing to ensure that anyone who provides their own consent is at least 13 year, years old. And if children are under 13, then you must also make reasonable efforts, again, using available technology to verify that the person giving consent does in fact hold parental responsibility for the child. And, you know, there, there are lots of different age verification processes and technologies available. And, and what's appropriate will really depend on the, the online service and the type of data that, that is being collected and processed. Um, but, but age gates, you know, they range from the sort of, I suppose, the more common self declaration type uh, age gates where you just input your own date of birth there's also use of ai for facial recognition to try and assess this you know someone's age by by um that 
looking at their 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 face through a selfie or, or something like that. There's also the analysis of online usage patterns to assess a user's maturity. So what type of content are they accessing? Is that in line with the age that they've given in order to access the site? And obviously, technology is constantly developing. And, uh, you know, no doubt there will be additional age verification practices that that uh, are developed. So it's a case of looking at what is the type of service that you're offering and, and what would suit suit you best, but continuing to assess that and update it as and when new technology becomes available. What are some of the other common types of data privacy violations that businesses should be aware of and how can they prevent them? I think there is a kind of, um, you know, the most obvious type of data violation or a breach is the classic sending an email to the wrong addressee recipient containing personal data of someone else and those are the ones that people tend to react to most quickly there's also a more kind of wide-ranging cyber incident where uh, a business has been hacked or held at ransom and their data has been locked Um, those are kind of more obvious breaches but it can really be something as simple as you collected an individual's personal data for one purpose and you use it for a different purpose such as marketing and send them advertisements by email for example. Yeah and I I, th- I think sort of carrying on from that there are the sort of headline grabbing breaches that you might see in the press where an organisation has had a, a, a massive fine from, from the ICO but a data privacy violation, as Fran says, can be as simple as not having the correct policies and procedures to comply with the principles under the the UK GDPR, or failing to comply with, you know, a data subject's request within the the required timeframe or um, in accordance with the rules under the UK GDPR. So there are lots of different ways in which you can be in breach of the data privacy rules, but you know, as Fran says, not all of them will necessarily result in, you know, a huge fine or, or someone taking action, but it but it is still considered a breach of, of the regulation. Mm. I think I think in addition to that as well, I think as Charlie alluded to, the these kind of headline grabbing um, articles are usually about big corporate companies, you know, the British Airways and EasyJets and TikToks of the world. Um, but it, it's worth noting that the, G, the GDPR, UK GDPR and data protection laws apply equally to businesses. Yes, you have to do, you know, consider how it applies to you and your type of business and the number of individuals involved and the type of data you're processing for them and why. But, you know, everybody all organisations have to comply if they're processing personal data. So you touched upon a little bit there about how organisations need to be transparent about the data that they're collecting and their processing practices. What are some of the legal requirements around transparency in data privacy and how can businesses ensure that they're meeting these requirements? So Article 5.1 of the UK GDPR says that personal data must be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. And transparent processing really means being clear, open and honest with people from the start about who you are and how why you're using your, their, your personal data, how long you're keeping it and who you're going to share it with. And generally speaking, um, you need to provide individuals um, with this information at the time you collect their personal data. So you can't just start processing someone's data without telling them all the ways in which you're going to use it. And you must also, I think probably most importantly, ensure that you tell individuals about the processing in a way that's easily accessible and easy to understand. So using clear and plain language and as I mentioned earlier uh, in relation to children there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution for transparency so and the provision of privacy information so it needs to be tailored to the intended audience be that children 
be that um, those who are perhaps visually impaired or deaf, that, that, you know, the information needs to be presented in a way in which those who are um, going to be accessing it um, can do so in a manner that means that they can understand the information clearly. I think it's probably also worth mentioning uh, data protection impact assessments. Can you please explain what are data protection impact assessments, um, why they should be conducted regularly and uh, what they're there to do, how they can help businesses to ensure they're compliant? Yes, so a a data protection impact assessment, also referred to as a DPIA, catchly, um, is is basically a process to help you identify and minimise the data protection risks of a project. So I'd I'd really encourage people to think of it a bit like, you know, undertaking any other sort of risk assessment. So you have to do um, a DPIA for processing that's likely to result in a high risk to individuals. So in those situations, you need to do one. But it's also good practice to do a DPIA for any major project, really, which requires the processing of personal data. And a DPIA you know, must address certain things. So it, it must describe the nature scope, context and purpose of the processing. It must assess the necessity, proportionality and the compliance measures that that you've got in place. It must identify and assess any risks to individuals and it must also identify any additional measures to mitigate those risks. So if you've identified that there are some potential risks to individuals, it must then set out what measures you've put in place to to mitigate those risks. And in assessing the level of risk, you need to be considering both the likelihood and also the severity of any impact on individuals. So the likelihood of any form of risk to an individual might be low, but the severity of that impact might be very high. So you're looking at at both factors. A high risk um, could result either from a high probability of some harm or a lower possibility of serious harm, if that makes sense. And it's, you know, the, the, the key point, I suppose, coming out of this is that if you do identify a high risk that you cannot mitigate, then you must consult the ICO before starting the processing. And and that's something that shouldn't be forgotten. There's no point just carrying out a DPIA, then putting it in the drawer and and doing nothing about it. If you've identified a high risk, then, then you must consult with the ICO. And again, sort of coming back to that, you know, carrying out a a DPIA, it's not just a tick box exercise. If if you're going to be genuinely compliant, you need to be, you know, coming back, looking at your DPIA, has the way in which the processing um, is carried out changed? Um, Does that change the outcome of the DPIA? Um, and, And do any other mitigations need to be put in place to minimize potential harm? So say that it's all gone wrong and uh, a business has been fined for a data privacy violation. What are their options for disputing the fine of appealing the decision? So initially, um, upon receipt of, of the the letter of intent or a notice of intent that the ICO would issue, the organisation would have an opportunity to make representations um, in response. And as, as, in, as happened to TikTok here, um, they the ICO proposed a, a much larger fine than was actually issued. Um, I think initially it was twenty uh, due to be twenty seven million pounds, and it was lowered to twelve point seven million, and and that that is quite common following the representation stage. If um, after that there there is another option to appeal, and there are kind of two aspects to that. One is appealing the fact that enforcement action is being taken or to appeal the amount of of a fine. And organisations can do that by appealing to the first tier tribunal. And that is essentially almost embarks on a a court process. So you have to file in a very kind of brief sense, I suppose, a, a form to appeal the decision with the first tier tribunal. 
the ICO and its representatives will have an opportunity to respond to that and it will go through uh, similar to a court process. Um, a judge will make the final decision. There is an opportunity to appeal the first tier tribunal's decision to the upper tier tribunal um, and after that it would then go into the the court process so to the court of appeal so there is a basis for challenge it's there are time scales within which that must be done so for example after the ico has sent the penalty notice through organizations have only 28 days to appeal to the first tier tribunal and there is some scope to ask for more time but that's at the discretion of the tribunal so you might as well get on with completing um, your appeal in the first place. So we've spent a lot of this episode discussing best practices uh, for businesses to follow when it comes to data privacy. Um, How can businesses ensure that they're staying up to date with the latest uh, laws and regulations in this area? Apart from listening to this podcast, of course, and uh, visiting the info hub at uh, rwkgoodman.com. Um, Attending our seminars, um, signing up to our articles, all the really helpful information um, that we give. But um, there's also, of course, keeping, reviewing your policies and procedures, ensuring that they accurately reflect how your organisation is controlling and processing data. That that starts with a data map. And I think Charlie can speak more to that. I think in the event of a breach, organisations should always react promptly if there is an incident which has occurred and ensure that appropriate, an appropriate response occurs. So things like undertaking an assessment as to whether that breach is reportable to the ICO or to the data subjects. There are two different thresholds for that and those are associated with whether there's a risk of harm to the individual that whose data is involved in the breach. They should keep records of breaches and responses to them. They should review their the way that things are done, review training and potentially upskill their staff or refresh training given to their staff in response there are a whole host of things that that can be done to you know prevent breaches but also you know cure them um, and reacting promptly to secure data so asking people to delete an email that they've received in error permanently and confirm that to you um, so that you've got a paper trail it, it can be as simple as that really yeah i i think i i agree with everything that, that fran has said i think the you know, the key thing to remember is that there is always more guidance coming out from the ICO as to best practice. And so far as possible, whoever is responsible for, for data protection within your business or organisation, whether or not they're a formal data protection officer or not, um, they should be trying to, you know, stay on top of of that as far as they can as long as uh, you know as well as coming to all our our, our seminars and listening to our podcasts etc but it's you know it's important to remember that gdpr compliance and data protection compliance doesn't just happen sort of in a one-off scenario you don't just put in place a load of policies and then forget about them it, it is something that is continual and has to be regularly reviewed and updated you know in the same way that business processes and and the way in which you do things change over time. um, And that should be reflected in your internal policies and and processes in relation to to data protection. And then as, as Fran said, you know, if something does go wrong, don't stick your head in the sand, do something about it, react promptly, whether that is, you know, following your own internal processes for, for dealing with that situation or seeking legal advice, I would encourage anyone to do do that sooner rather than later, um, because as Fran says, often if effects uh, of a, um, a data breach or a violation um, can be minimised to some degree by taking prompt action. So it's important not to just ignore it and hope that it will go away. I think organisations are often reluctant to report to the ICO um, if they don't have to um, because they don't really want to tell anyone that this has happened and also reluctant to report to their customers or the data subject that that something like this has happened but 
you know, that all comes back to the transparency principle. And I think transparency goes a long way in these situations. And from my experience, the ICO always reacts quite well and reasonably to organisations reporting these incidents to them and telling them what they've done about it. And it's kind of that, that um, it's important that you take legal advice or, you know, take some advice and ensure that you are comfortable with with the steps that you are taking because that is likely to put you in a better position when dealing with the ICO and your customers. Fran and Charlie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to Legal Thinking and thank you to our guests um, for joining us on today's podcast. Uh, If you want to find out more about the topic that was discussed today, make sure to have a look in the show notes where we will have linked everything up. And you can find all of the back episodes of Legal Thinking in your podcast provider of choice and you can also subscribe and follow us on there too. And as always, make sure you leave us a five-star review on a podcast provider of choice as that helps other people find us. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.